Hi, I'm Ryan from Amber Ale. This video is timestamped, so if you want to skip right into the mic stuff, go right ahead. But I need to start this one with a bit of prologue. I don't know why, but I do. So, having a YouTube channel is an odd thing. There have been loads of videos sort of explaining the problem of needing to create content to succeed on the platform, and that content coming at the expense of the creator's own creative output. When I started this channel about a year ago, the goal was just to create a channel that documented what I was doing, but in a way that gave the viewer something to take away, whether that was education on a topic, inspiration, or just entertainment. The goal was to center it around whatever I was doing. My early videos sort of explored things like tape delay, uh, creative questions, composition, and composers. Then the channel sort of morphed into a synth tube channel because, well, I got really into synthesizers. I always tried to give the caveat that I was truly a beginner with synths, and the goal was never to become a synth tuber or even an artist that wrote primarily on synthesizers. But most days in the studio, I would explore modular synths through VCV rack, eventually my own, still expanding Euro rack setup, different synthesizers that I found and enjoyed. And so a lot of the videos on my channel over the last six months or so have been centered around synthesizers. And it was almost purely because the new avenue of sound that they opened up for me. But if I'm being honest, I think it's also because of the subscribers that it got me. As soon as I started in on talking about synths and ambient music and ambient textures, two things that I viewed as a side to my music, not the main course, my subscriber count shot up. Watch time went up and it felt good. I wanted to and still want to have a nice community of people here who enjoy what I do and get value out of it, you know, share ideas with each other. But I think that sort of led me farther down the road of synths and ambient music than I would have gone on my own. And some of that is awesome and it opened me up to researching different artists, techniques and synths. But some of it came at the expense of my own creative output as an artist. Like, I don't think I released anything in 2023 while I was really focusing on my YouTube channel. It wasn't something that I even noticed, just something that sort of happened or didn't happen. To be honest, the fact that this video is about microphones and I started in with a bunch of prologue about YouTube, the studio will probably perform a lot worse than it might if I just started with me holding an SM57. It would also get a lot more traction if I talked about microphones while promising to give away a Neumann U47 in some batch crazy competition, like the last person to stop playing piano while increasing the tempo every 10 minutes. And my thumbnails look like this. And then I had a camera cut every two seconds, but I don't want to do that. Turns out I really enjoy making videos and building a community of like-minded people. I guess my point is that I want this community to grow into more than just synth lovers. I want it to reflect my own interests, which of course includes synths and ambient music, ambient textures, but also include things that I haven't really talked about on this channel, like analog gear, mixing plugins, old vintage mixers, writing for strings, and yes, microphones. It sounds sort of cringy, but I started this channel to share my musical journey in a way that brought entertainment and education to the people who watched it. And if you're subscribed to the channel because I talk a lot about synths or ambient textures, I hope you stay along for the ride because I'll still be trying to entertain and educate as I go. And who knows, you may like me find a rabbit hole that you didn't know existed and get lost diving way deep into it. Also, just as a side note, trying to have a synth tube channel when you're a small channel who isn't sponsored by anybody gets pretty expensive. Every piece of new gear that I talk about on here, I went out and bought with my own money. It gets pretty unsustainable if people aren't sending you free stuff to review. I'm looking at you, ASM. So with that out of the way, let's take a walk through the wonderful world of microphones. A few weeks ago, I decided to release an EP. It's gonna be mainly piano, with some help from Eurorack, cello, maybe a few other synth patches for texture. Before I start recording, I like to get each track's sound palette together. For me, that means sort of scratch recording a bunch of different elements, trying to find the best sounds recorded in the right ways. And since the main instrument on the EP is gonna be piano, that's where I start. Now I have a lot of really nice piano plugins from UA, Spitfire, and some other places, but each of them sound a bit flat compared to recording my upright Yamaha in the studio. Something about recording the instruments live really do give them a more 3D sound, even if it isn't as manicured as the ones you may get from a sample library. Also, it gives your art a sound that is literally your own. Just as it is with synths and ambient music, I'm not an expert when it comes to microphones, mic placement, or recording in general. But one, I've been doing it for a while, and two, I have a lot of friends that are. And when I get into this phase of making music, I'm on the phone with them day and night pretty much, trying to learn as much as I can about sound. So when we're talking about microphones, there are a few different types of mics that we need to talk about and consider. Dynamic mics, small diaphragm condenser mics, large diaphragm condenser mics, and ribbon mics. All these mics have sort of standard use cases, which I'll touch on as I go through them. Starting out with dynamic mics like the Shure SM57 or the 58, they're really good on sources that can get loud. Guitar amps, drums, horns, they're not gonna be as detailed, uh, but they'll record most things pretty accurately, and they're some of the most durable mics. Large diaphragm condensers like the AKG414, Neumann U87, Rode NT1, and probably hundreds, if not thousands of others, they're used on almost everything. 
They capture clean recordings, have a really low self noise, and give solo instruments a richer, more vibrant sound compared to small diaphragm condensers or dynamic mics. They're also probably the microphone that most non-musicians associate with like being in the studio. Small diaphragm condensers or pencil mics have some advantages though. They have a really great transient response, pick up high frequencies really well, and have really consistent polar patterns. They'll give you a lot of detail on orchestral instruments, high frequency sources like cymbals, or just anything that you want the detail to be captured. They're used a lot as drum overheads or in combination with other mics when micing an instrument. Ribbon mics are great at capturing sound in a natural way. You're not gonna get a lot of high frequency detail as you might with a pencil mic, but you'll get a nice, warm, natural sound. One of the most fun and frustrating things about having all these types of microphones is once you know what they all do, you have to figure out what you're recording, how you want it to sound, and trying each of them or combinations of each of them at different placements to get the sound that you want. Because maybe more important than the microphone you use is where you place it. I'm recording my piano right now and I'll get a wildly different recording if I place a couple of mics behind the piano than if I mic'd up the front or close to the strings as opposed to three feet away or at ear level or high up to get the room. Add in changing the mics at those placements and you've kind of got an endless possibility of combinations, which is why it's best to sort of know what each mic does so you can make informed decisions and use different combination of mics so you can blend them how you want in the mix. The best advice I've ever received when it comes to placement is by using your ears. And by that, I mean having the instrument being played and walking around the room using your ear as a microphone just literally walk around the room putting your ear up to the instrument high low to the side walk around the room and take note of how it sounds in different spots when you land on a spot that you like put a microphone there if you like that spot because of how mellow it sounds maybe grab a ribbon if you like it because it's picking up a lot of detail like the hammers of the piano uh, maybe use a pencil mic and make sure you pick the best microphone. Hey Ryan, what's the best microphone? I'm glad you asked Ryan. There is no such thing as the best microphone. There is no such thing as the best microphone. I struggled with this one and I think it applies to most things, not just microphones. There's no such thing as the best synthesizer or the best Eurorack module, or the best piano or the best microphone. Each of them offer different sounds. Not better sounds, but different sounds. Some may be more accurate than others, offer more detail in the high end, offer more warmth in the low end, but that may not be the best microphone for your application. Let's dive into this a little more because I think it might be the most important piece of information I think I've learned about microphones. If I'm recording my piano in the studio here, I have to take a lot of things besides the piano into consideration, and it involves some critical listening. The most important thing to consider is what does my piano actually sound like in the room? What does the room actually sound like? Do I want the room sound to come through in the recording? What does the high end of the piano really sound like? If I used a pair of Neumann K84s in my room, would it sound better than a cheaper, less detailed mic like my AKG 170s? I don't know about better, but it would sound much more detailed and more accurate. But in my loft studio, I don't know if I want to be that accurate. The room itself doesn't sound amazing. Certain mic choices will really accentuate that reality. If I move my piano into air studios or another room that costs millions of dollars to construct with acoustics in mind, I'd imagine my AKG 170s would do a worse job of accurately reproducing the room that I was in. In that case, I'm going with the most detailed, accurate mic I can find. Maybe the KM84s are my choice in that scenario. If you're struggling with this concept, let's see if this helps. It's analogy time. What's the best car? And before you answer, think about it. What's the best car? Is there one? If you're a contractor, your answer is gonna be very different than if you're a hedge fund manager or if you're a soccer mom. I don't think the contractor is gonna be happy with that Porsche 911 at the construction site. I don't think the hedge fund manager is gonna love showing up to his fancy ass office in his late 2014 Toyota Sienna minivan, even though the Sienna is spacious comfortable, and I mean, it's pretty cool mini I have a Sienna. Maybe the soccer mom wants a night out on the town and that Porsche is more suitable. Maybe the contractor's taking all his kids and their friends to the pool and the minivan fits everybody. Maybe the hedge fund manager's going camping for the weekend and doesn't want his Lambo ruined by the five miles of off-road driving they're gonna be doing. You get it, right? Cars serve different functions. There's a time and a place for a truck, a minivan, and a luxury sports car. Mics are no different. Understanding what different types of mics do well is the first step. Then listening to different ones in context of where you're gonna be recording and what you're gonna be recording really should be determining what the best microphone is. It's gonna change all the time. If you're recording in a home studio with little to no treatment, you may be wasting your money on a $3,000 stereo matched pair of pencil mics when these Behringer C2s may sound better in your room. I'm in a situation where I've treated my studio a bit and I know I like to close mic my piano and don't want much room sound, so I went with a couple of ribbons for the job. I'm using these Coles 4038s, uh, but I never really tried other less expensive ribbons on the piano. I heard some recordings that used them, I liked the sound, saved up and got a pair. Not really understanding any of the things that I talked about here today. I'm really 
really curious about trying the Royer R1, which is their budget ribbon mic, or like the golden age ribbon mics on the piano. They may sound warmer or more detailed than my Coles. Each of them will offer a different flavor. None of them is better than the other necessarily. If you have access to a rental place, I suggest renting a bunch of mics one weekend and trying out different ones and different placements before you settle down and buy any one of them. This is just microphones. We haven't even gotten into like preamps or EQ, compression. It all affects the sound. Not in a good way or a bad way, just different ways. Good or bad, better or worse, really lies within your own taste. And you should be making all these decisions with only that in mind. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.